In today's video, we're going to figure out exactly what the white noise texture does. And while we demystify it, we'll figure out how it works, where it can be applied, and how you can use it in your own animations. And with that, let's actually begin demystifying the white noise texture. I've set up a simple scene with a plane that has the default material attached to it. Now, the first thing that we want to do is press Shift A and search for the white noise texture and add that value into the base color. Now, you see, we get this particular grayish color. And even if we switch to color, we get one single purple color for the entire plane. So this doesn't look like actual noise, which means the output from here is one single value for the entire plane. And that's because the white noise texture will give an output based on the actual vector location. So right now it's not getting any input. So it's giving a single output for the entire plane. So we can press shift A and search for a value node to test this particular theory. If we take this value and plug it into the vector by changing this value on the value node, you see we get random variations on this color ranging between zero to one itself, but it's completely different even if you change this value by just a little bit. So even if you change it to like 0 0.02, you see you get a completely different value. It absolutely doesn't matter how small the change is, the output will be completely random, but it's occurring for the entire plane because it's a single value. If you want to have a different value for every single position on the plane, you can simply use the texture coordinates of this particular plane. So let's press shift A and search for a texture coordinate and plug any one of these that have outputs that vary based on the position. Remember, outputs like the normal will not vary based on the position, but will vary depending on the direction. And since all of these are facing in the same direction, you'll get a very similar output as we were getting all the while with a single value only. So let's take generated and plug it into the vector. And you see, if you actually look at the generated texture coordinates, you have a different value for every single position on this particular plane. So that's why when we now look at the white noise texture that's been generated, we can start seeing the actual noise. I don't know how well the noise is visible with YouTube's compression, but I assure you there is quite a bit of noise. Now, if I start zooming in, no matter how far I zoom in, the noise seems to have the exact same scale and is still just as fine as it was even when I was completely zoomed out. So that is the main use of this white noise texture. No matter how far you zoom in, because there's still gonna be slight variation in the position, the noise will remain. However, there's still a slight issue. The problem is right now I have the samples set down to three. If I start increasing the number of samples, let's go to something like 1000, the noise that we were seeing starts to smoothen out. And right now it's a really fine color that's probably around a value of 0 0.5. There's absolutely no more noise that I can see. And even if I zoom in, as soon as the samples start calculating, it slowly smooths out into one single color without any noise. And let's say I want to have a high number of samples. How do we possibly use this white noise texture? And why is it becoming one single color? For that, let's actually figure out how rendering engines work, which if you've watched this particular video, you already know exactly what's happening when you hit the render button. Definitely check that video out if you haven't already. But either way, let's go through a very brief example. There are two types of render engines, which are ray tracing and rasterizing. And both of them involve a camera that calculates individual pixels and along with that, some objects and light sources. So whether it's a ray tracing engine where there's a ray calculated for every pixel that goes out in random directions for every sample, or it's a rasterizing engine, which actually calculates it from the object side towards the camera and figures out what was intersected by this particular ray and samples that for every pixel, there's essentially going to be pixels on the screen that are calculated. So let's take the example of a particular screen and figure out what's happening. Remember, pixels are not infinitesimally small. Even if you look at this screen, pixels are going to be like a grid, as you can see over here. Even if each one of these are pixels, they still have some amount of height and width. When each of these rays are calculated, they're not always calculated at a single position for the pixel. It's actually calculated at different positions for the pixel for every single sample. So right now I have the samples set to 1000. Maybe let's reduce that down to three for this example. And let's assume we have a camera over here that has a resolution set to one by four pixels. So for each sample, it's going to shoot out one ray or it's going to calculate one particular position for each of these four pixels. So maybe this could be the first one. This is the second one, third one, and the fourth one. Now, remember, it sampled this particular position over here. And for the second pixel, it sampled this position. Third one sampled this position and the fourth one sampled this position. Now, when it gets to the second sample, what it's going to do is it's going to calculate not exactly this position, but maybe this position for this pixel. And remember, because the white noise texture changes completely, no matter how small the change is in the input vector, the value here is going to be completely different from this particular value. So when it takes this value, it's going to get a completely different number for this particular pixel. Then the 
the same thing is going to happen for this pixel. And then maybe this one samples it over here. And then this one could sample it maybe over here. Now it's stored those values and it's going to take the same thing once again. This time, maybe it samples it from here for this pixel. And it does something similar for each of these other pixels as well. So if you actually take a look at the randomness of these values, they're going between zero to one. So let's take this pixel, for example, and look at what the three different values might have been. Let's say this particular sample gave it a value of 0 0.1. Maybe this one gave it a value of 0 0.9. And this one maybe gave it a value of 0 0.5. This pixel will take the average of these three values. And finally, when it's rendered, it'll take in the average. So that value right now is equal to 0 0.5 itself. And yes, I picked the numbers accordingly. But if this was truly random numbers, the more samples you take, the more it will tend towards 0 0.5. Because all the low values will get cancelled out by the high values and you will be left with the absolute middle value, which is 0 0.5. And because the white noise texture has equal intensities for every single one of the values between 0 to 1, it's going to give us a value of 0 0.5 itself once you start increasing the number of samples. Similarly, let's say this one entire pixel got a value of 0 0.49. This one might get a value of 0 0.51. This pixel might have gotten 0 0.52. And maybe this one got 0 0.50. On average, when you look at a picture that has maybe 1000 pixels on this side and 1000 pixels on that side, and each of the pixels are so close to 0 0.5, on average, it'll look like the entire board is exactly 0 0.5 and you won't be able to tell that fine noise. So that's what was happening when we were starting to increase the number of viewport samples. So let's figure out how we can change that. The first thing that we have to do is make sure that the value remains constant for a specific area and not just a specific point. So to convert this, from a point to a small area, we can simply add in the actual mapping node. So to convert it into a small area, we can actually take the output of this vector and round it. So for that, we can search for a vector math node. And remember, if you haven't checked the demystification of the vector math node, definitely check that out as well if you're interested. But for this video, we're going to switch it from add to either floor or seal, which are two different types of rounding, which will take any value between two whole numbers and convert them into one single value, which will be used for the seed of the white noise texture. So for now, let's take the seal and then plug that in right after the mapping node. Now you see we get individual pixels with one color and no matter how much you zoom in, they remain that particular size. And no matter how much you increase the viewport samples, they still remain that particular color itself. Now, if you want to change the size of this particular box, you can actually increase the scale and you see you get either smaller boxes or you get larger boxes by reducing the scale on the mapping node. Now, of course, all this while we've been looking at it through the principled BSDF, so the lighting is off. If you actually look at just the output from the white noise texture, there are complete white values and complete black values. This perfectly ranges from zero to one, which would answer a question that many of you might be getting. Why not just use the Voronoi texture? Because right now, if we were to take this Voronoi texture and take this same generated texture coordinates, plug it into the vector and take the color and plug that into the base color, we should get very similar outputs. Of course, this is giving us color values. So let's search for a color ramp node, which will convert it into black and white. And if we just reduce the randomness, we get the same cell blocks. If we were to control shift click this, you might start noticing the problem. Although we're going from black to white completely, there aren't too many black values. If we increase the scale, even the darkest points are not that dark. On the other hand, when we were looking at the white noise texture with a fairly high scale, you see there are actually very dark values and there's an equal distribution of the dark values and the bright values. That simply doesn't exist with the Voronoi texture. This is because the actual randomness that they're using are calculated on different things. The white noise texture has a graph that's fairly plain. If we were to take a graph of the different frequencies, or in this case, it'll just be the different values that come out from the white noise texture versus how many times they appear, or in this case, the intensity. For pure white noise, you'll have something that's very close to this particular distribution. So in this case, this is a value of one, this is a value of zero, and you get all of the points in between almost the same number of times whenever you were to sample the noise texture again. On the other hand, if you were to take a noise texture, the noise texture actually has values that look something like this, where you have a maximum distribution towards the center and you get very little distribution towards these ends. Similar if you look at the Voronoi texture, we clearly saw that this back end is not really getting that many values. So it might be something that has a distribution like this. Of course, I'm not sure about the distribution of the Voronoi texture, but the noise texture is definitely like this. 
And from what we just saw, the Voronoi texture seems to be something like this, whereas white noise is going to be exactly like this. That's another use of the white noise texture. Remember, there are other types of noises as well. So you do have pink noise and brown noise, as well as green noise. The noise texture that I just showed you is mostly like green noise, where the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies are much low, and you just have random frequencies towards the middle of the audible spectrum. Pink noise has more bass frequencies and lower amounts of high frequencies, whereas brown noise has even more bass frequencies and similarly low high frequencies. So there are different types of noise and we are currently using the white noise texture. So the same thing would happen if you were to use different colors. So let's press shift A and search for another color ramp node and give it five different colors. Here we have five different colors. If we were to take the Voronoi texture and plug that into the factor and similarly have another version for the white noise texture, you'll see that the Voronoi texture has all the colors, but evidently there's far more red present all around the these regions as compared to the other colors. So mostly red and blue are dominating the entire screen. There's very little green and very little light blue, although the distribution is absolutely equal on the color ramp. The same thing will not happen when we use the actual white noise texture. Here you can see the distribution is equal amongst all the different five colors that we've used. And that is why we use the white noise texture. Just for the sake of it, you can also see that if we use the normal noise texture, we get mostly this middle value itself, which is why it's predominantly red. Even if you were to reduce the scale, you can clearly see there's way too much red and there's absolutely no light blue or green, which clearly shows that graph that I showed a while ago, which distributes how much of each of these are present. So clearly the noise texture is not distributed evenly across the entire spectrum. And that's just how you use the white noise texture in this scenario. Let's go on to another scenario of using the white noise texture. Over here, I have a bunch of spheres that are distributed that have the same material applied to it. Now, if you look at each of these spheres, they look the exact exact same because they're using the same material. However, maybe I wanted to have some variation for the noise on every single one so that I get a random variation for each of these. Now, there are multiple ways of going about it. And if you watch this particular video of mine, you'll get another method of creating infinite variations of designs like this. However, today we'll be using the white noise texture. If you were to press Control T with the Node Wrangler enabled, you'll notice that whether we use the generated or the object coordinates, you still have the exact same thing distributed for all of the objects. However, if you want to change each of these separately, you can actually press shift A and search for an object info node. And that has this random socket. However, the random socket is just a single value. And so the way you would want to use this is by pressing shift A and searching for a white noise texture and using a combined XYZ node to convert this from a single value to a vector. So let's press shift A and search for the combined XYZ node and take this random value, plug it into any one of the three sockets, plug the vector into the vector. And now this value can go into the W socket of the noise texture. Now you'll see each one gets a random variation. And if you want to increase the amount of variation, you can actually just scale this up by shifting this over and pressing shift A and searching for another vector math node and switching this from add to scale. If you plug that in over here and just scale it up by a large number, you'll see you have absolute random variations for each of these particular spheres. Now, if you want to change the seed value, all you have to do is just change any one of these values on the combined XYZ node and you'll get a completely new random seed every single time. Similarly, if if you were to just press shift D and X and bring this over, each of these will also have their own random variations and they won't be the same as this particular object over here. So no matter how many times you do it, you're going to get a new random variation. And that is how powerful the white noise texture is for situations like this to prevent repeating patterns in different objects. However, I still feel like there's a lot of similarity and that's because the white noise texture value is gonna give a value between zero to one every single time. So every single one of these noise textures is getting a W value between zero to one. So to change that, all you have to do is press shift A and search for a math node, plug that in after the white noise texture and change it from add to multiply and then multiply this by a large number as well. And with that, you'll get a complete random variation every single time, which will have absolutely no amount of repeat no matter what you do. And I think that's a very cool application of the white noise texture. However, there's still another application which is very useful in multiple regions. Here, I have this scene set setup where I have this ball and an HDRI present in the world background. The ball is completely reflective, so you get a complete reflection of the HDRI. Along with that, because I have screen space reflections switched on, you get the reflection of these particular objects that are also present in the scene. Now, of course, there will be times when you want these reflections of all the other objects to be sharply present within the reflection of whatever object you have. However, you don't want the actual HDRI to be seen this well. Now, suppose you switch off your HDRI, the reflective object 
objects won't look too reflective or good at all. So clearly you can see this sphere doesn't look too good. So that's why it's important to sometimes have HDRIs when you have reflective materials for everything to look nice and reflective. However, you might not want the HDRI to be seen. For that, if you were to go to your object and just increase the roughness a bit, the nice sharp reflections that you were getting of these different objects would also no longer be sharp. So that might not be something that you want. Maybe you want the objects to still have sharp reflections, but you want the HDRI only to be blurred. So in that case, it's actually very simple. Switch over to the world tab and blur out the HDRI. For that, press Ctrl T to get the texture coordinate and mapping nodes and just mix in some white noise to this generated texture coordinates. To mix in some noise, you have to search for the mix color node and plug that in right over here. Now we're going to switch this from mix to linear light to prevent the slight distortion that would have appeared if we just kept it at mix. Then we'll press shift and search for a white noise texture and plug that into socket B. Now, of course, if we just use the white noise texture, we're going to get the same value for everything. So it's just going to look distorted. Instead, take this generated and plug that into the vector of the white noise. And now you have a blurred out version of the HDRI while retaining sharp reflections for other objects present in your scene. Now you can change this factor to change the amount of blur. If you just want a little bit of blur, you can keep the factor down at something like 0.1. And I think that's actually good enough. Apart from that, you can always increase the factor all the way to one to go completely crazy and make it complete noise. I think a value of 0.1 works really well. And there's also another use of doing this. And that's because the textures that you use might not be with too high of a resolution. So in my case, I'm using a 2K HDRI and that might cause some pixelations when you zoom in. Now, of course, you could use the 8K variations of it. Like this is the 8K variation. But now you see it might be a lot clearer here. But with this slight blur, I no longer need this 8K resolution. Even the 2K resolution is giving me the exact same result. And that's why by switching over to the 2K resolution image, I'd actually be able to render this much faster and use much lower memory in my GPU, which will allow me to work on other things as well while rendering out this scene. So often if you're running low on memory, but you don't want the background to be pixelated, instead of having a pixelated background, you can have a blur background by just using the white noise texture with a little bit of linear light added into it. So those were three different ways is you can actually use the white noise texture and I hope you understood how it works and maybe you'll be able to figure out your own applications to it as well. I personally found this a bit surprising because I used the white noise texture to create some light noise within a scene which was looking really good in my viewport but when I rendered it with higher samples everything was smooth and I didn't really understand why that happened. So when I went further into some more research as to what exactly the white noise is doing I figured out why that happened and that's why I thought it has to be shared with all of you as well. I hope you learned something from this video and if you've stuck around so long thank you so much for watching because the watch time really helps me i post videos every single day so definitely check out other videos on my channel because i'm sure there's something or the other just waiting for you to discover them until my next video comes out tomorrow thank you so much for watching once again keep creating and don't forget to stay creative